You ready, Gene? I'm here. Yep, ready. Okay. I want to get going kind of early um, because uh, Councilor Bergman has to leave us at 5.30 for another city council meeting. Um, so I was hoping to amend the agenda as published to, to move uh, the item number seven to the top of the list or to move it ahead of uh, approval of the minutes or right after approval of the minutes and additionally move the water resources reorg uh, organizational assessment just after that and then public forum next, if that's um, acceptable to everyone. Yeah. It is to me. Okay, do we need to maybe make a, um, can we just do that? I'd so move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. So, um, so we'll jump right in then. Um, First uh, item on our agenda is the agenda. I we guess we've just amended and approved that. Um, next, our approval of our minutes from our uh, meeting on 5-3. I move to adopt the minutes. I second. Is there any discussion? No? Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. So our meeting, our minutes from last meeting are approved and we'll jump right into um, the McNeil Symposium update. Um, uh, the brief update is we have uh, scheduled um, the meeting for uh, June 13th um, at Contois. It'll be at 6.30. I think we're tentatively have a three hour block, 6.30 to 9.30ish, um, sort of uh, carved out. Um, I've talked to um, Zach at uh, BCA. Um, who manages events set up there, and they're apprised of our needs. Um, and I've also traded some email with Town Meeting TV for coverage. One question Town Meeting TV asked, and I said I would ask this committee, um, is whether or not we wanted to live stream it. And I don't see why we wouldn't, but I would um, just wanted to make sure everybody else was on board with that as well. Sorry. I think that makes and Jean, are you, you good with that? Yes, I, I'm fine. And uh, Hannah, if you could speak much more loudly for my old ears, I'd really thank you. <laughs> I can do that. Thanks. Um, and so I will let them know that in addition to recording it, that we'll also want, um, want them to live stream it. And um, I'll coordinate that with, um, with BCA and event set up in case there's anything special they need to be, to know about for, the town meeting TV um, being there as well. Um, and then the other big, uh, I guess, Gene, did you want to update, give an update on some of the responses that you've received? Yeah, yeah. So um, we have got two of the three outside experts. Uh, these are uh, uh, Professor Mama and uh, Professor um, Rooney Vague or, uh, Vargas. And uh, both are like, internationally renowned uh, people in uh, the burning of biomass. And I, I think, uh, and they only want to get, at least so far, uh, their travel expenses um, compensated overnight and you know, travel and what have you. So it's gonna be, uh, I think, a really important um, uh, piece. And then we've gotten um, from BED, um, a number of uh, folks, uh, somebody from VEIC who did the um, the emissions uh, report for um, VEIC or from VEIC, VEIC to uh, Mc, uh, about McNeil. And we've got uh, a forestry professor uh, at UVM who is not associated with, uh, uh, with BED, but is an expert to my understanding in uh, forestry and we have got a uh, one of our uh, um, I think he's a, a planning commissioner uh, Rowan uh, Harris Rowan who is also a forester and was on I believe the state's biomass task force so um, I might be wrong on that he was on one state uh, 
task force on biomass. So uh, I think it will be a really good um, mix of people. And um, I have sent everybody uh, questions, but then I also sent us as I was like seeing how I would be uh, communicating about the format uh, with uh, Professor Muma uh, tomorrow because he's asked me to do that. Um, I, uh, I realized that we needed a lot more specificity and hence I had emailed, uh, to the, uh, to Maddie, uh, for posting. I didn't see it posted, but would hope that it would be. And, uh, also the rest of the committee, um, a, uh, a, my idea for, uh, an amendment to the general format that we had and included in that. Um, amendment was a uh, a request that we not ask the questions on district energy because I did not see how that would be related uh, as closely as we needed uh, to the question of the burning of biomass and its relation to carbon emissions. Um, uh, and so I had proposed and have proposed changing, uh, eliminating that, but I had a conversation with Darren today, Darren Springer, who suggested that they could provide the information that we're asking in uh, question four, and then we could ask uh, panelists for their, um, their comments on that. And then they would be able to talk about uh, the pros and cons or the um, just their um, reflections on, uh, on, the inf on that information that we were looking to get presented to us, but they could do that in um, in a narrative form at the top of the question. And he would be said he will be working to try to get that done as quickly as possible. And he thought that our question five really didn't need for their purposes for us to be um, asked. And I just didn't see how it related to really what our focus is, which is the, uh, the emissions from the, uh, the harvesting of biomass and its use in fuel generation at McNeil. So I continue to think that question five um, would be best asked at a different event. I think it's important and we should ask it, but I just don't see how uh, the people that we've asked to come and speak to this can speak to it. And so I think that is my update and my proposal, which is, I hope you all got a, uh, a word. Yeah. Well, you got it now. Okay. I, I leaned away. So uh, hopefully you got my um, format question, my, the way that I've approached the, uh, um, the, the format just to try to integrate that. And just uh, for, I guess, public consumption, there was a request that's reflected in the minutes of last meeting uh, by Councillor King to have a, another type of a public forum question and answer period. And I tried to integrate that like uh, she had suggested in that. I believe that is number 10 on my list. Um, and for those, I, Maddie, um, if, if you can at some point uh, post uh, um, Jean's uh, suggested format, document and uh, uh, and he was uh, Gene was referencing a set of questions um, and for those following along online or here in the room those those were attached to our last meeting um, agenda so you can see the list of uh, questions that we've sort of refined as prompts that we'll use to sort of uh, direct that discussion at the symposium um, so I guess we'll op open it up for discussion um, on meeting format. Do you, do you have some? No, I, I like the uh, changes that Jean proposed. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I like them as well. I like the idea of trying to um, stay on track. You know, we'll have two, two and a half, possibly three hours. It's a long time, but <clears throat> in some ways not, a, not enough to accomplish everything we want to accomplish. So. Um, it's important for us to prioritize um, the format of the meeting and sort of stay on track. Um, and again, like one of the main objectives of this meeting is to provide 
um, sort of a, a scientific underpinning to um, our discussion around McNeil, because um, there's been a lot of sort of differing uh, points of view on this, um, and uh, use that scientific underpinning to help direct policy decisions that we're going to be asked to make uh, around McNeil in the future. So, um, with that in mind, you know, I'd like to see, um, I'd like to make sure that if we're asking panelists to come and talk, that we provide ample opportunity for them to. Um, you know, convey that information. I did, I did, I did agree with Jean to, to cut away some of the introductory stuff. And one, and one of the ideas that I had was, like for instance, if we wanted to do introductions um, of the panelists, we could provide a, in sort of um, written form in terms of a, like a program for the evening so that we wouldn't have to spend a lot of time going through that. And I didn't know if anybody thought that might be a good idea. We could actually post some of the questions and the um, and sort of biographies, short biographies of the various panelists. Um, and so maybe we'll, we'll do that and we can and sort of endeavor offline to produce something like that or have something produced for us. Um, I'd be happy to make a program. Oh, great. Like make a draft and then send it around. Awesome. Um, and then the other thing um, that I had questions about were on the questions we're having submitted ahead, ahead of time, and which I think we, we ought to do because I think there's an opportunity for us to um, solicit questions and then sort of curate them into sort of thematic groups. And then we could, at the, if, I think it's being asked after the prompted questions that we'll have, we would entertain those questions. And if we had those, we could, as a committee, you know, in the midst of facilitating the meeting, decide what had been answered, what might not have been answered, and have an opportunity to sort of fill in some gaps with those questions. Um, so I'm, I'm still keen to do that um, as part of our, our format. And um, I guess is 30 minutes the amount that we would want to have for that? Does that seem still seem like a good amount for those? I mean, I, I think that these um, these suggested times are reasonable. Uh, on one hand, um, it's a short period of time and requires scientific answers to be spoken in English in a concise way. Um, but I think that. Um, having it be more open-ended uh, leads to people being able to talk as if they're giving a lecture and uh, the ability of folks to comprehend it uh, decreases the longer and the more complicated that that uh, uh, that uh, discussion happens. So um, I, I think these make sense, but I also, and so I think 30 minutes is correct on, on that amount. Um, what we did again, because we've got all of two and a half hours. And even with cutting these down and keeping these limits, um, we're at um, an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, yeah, well, we're 20 minutes short of three hours is what, whatever, 2.40. So uh, I, I think it makes sense. And then if we go over, or we can go over, we can lead um, to a little bit more time. And, and that's good. So I'm, I'm in favor of keeping it at 30, and I happen to think that this is a this is a good schedule myself. Okay. Um, at least right now, I would you know I want to test this with uh, one of the panelists tomorrow. Okay. Um, we know we're also going to reincorporate uh, question four, or some variation on question four. So we'll yeah, have to I, add yeah. some time for that as well. Um, I have yeah. a question about. Um, and I'm not against it. I just I, I wanted to understand how the public group discussion question time would work and and how it how it fits into the sequencing. Um, and I don't know if you could fill in what you were sort of thinking about that you know, um, last time. Last time I was thinking that it would just almost lessen the need to have a really long public forum because then it would just give the opportunity for people to talk amongst one another and give that 
you know, output um, method there. And so that was my thought process. Okay. I, 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 <clears throat> I'm, I still support it. I just I want to understand whether or not we do, are we doing breakout groups maybe, or are we trying to do, um, or just talk to your neighbor, or if it's? I don't think it needs to be super formal. I think it can just be like talk to the folks around you. Okay. Um, and so there's that, and then and I think we had allowed 20 minutes. 20 minutes, I think, is what I have down. And we had, and lastly, we had a 60-minute um, public forum. Um, and I, I liked your idea of, around trying to break that into segments so that we could have public forum and then allow responses. And in like um, I think you said, 10 minutes of public forum, 10 minutes of response, and then and then repeat that um, for up to three times for a 60 minute max. Um, the only thing I note about that is it will be hard to sort of keep us focused. We'll have to try to stay focused on the key, the key questions. So. I, I mean, I think that ultimately this is an opportunity for people to ask questions and for um, the panelists to not be overwhelmed by 30 minutes of questions. So 10 minutes, it's a lot fewer questions that you get or comments. Um, so I think we'll be able to handle that. And I think at this stage of the, um, the meeting that you know, it, we, I, we don't necessarily have to wrangle it and people can comment. I mean, this is an opportunity I think for folks to say what they need to say for other people to comment, whether they agree or disagree or want to amplify um, and uh, just sort of let it be in that regard. Additional changes to it. Um, I guess that we'll you'll you'll uh, test it with uh, one of the panels, Dr. Numa. Okay, and, and Numa. if he says this is this will not give me enough time to do what I need to do, and I'll come back to us and go, whoops, we still have some time to sort yeah. of work 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 it out. Um, well, good. Um, is there more we want to talk about in terms of? Um, planning for the symposium. If this is the format I, that we agree on, I think it would be best for us to at least uh, tonight uh, approve it, so that we've got it clear and it's in the in the minutes that we did that. Um, with the with an amendment to the uh, number eight, where it's it's to, uh, it's basically eliminating question five, but um, altering. Um, question four for them to be able to relate to. So I can I can amend that. I can I can fix that and and send that out. But uh, and I'd move that just so that we've got a record of our action. I think that's fine. Okay. So all those in favor of this format? Aye. Aye. Me. Okay, so we have a format and we have our updates, um, and so I think that concludes um, our McNeil Symposium update. Thanks, and thanks for uh, being flexible tonight and uh, trying to move this thing around so we could get um, Gene involved. Well, thank you, and I, there's a lot of noise back here, so let me know if it's like too noisy. Okay. Um, next on our uh, amended agenda is the Water Resources Organizational Assessment. Thanks, Thanks Chair Barlow. Uh, we have Division Director Megan Moyer who's going to lead the presentation. I will just say that uh, this is an important part of our uh, proactive work to plan for our future and that we uh, 
deserve a water system and wastewater system that's resilient and can stand the test of time uh, for all of Burlington's residents and businesses. And uh, I'm pleased that we've done this third party review. Megan's going to hit the highlights here. I am fully supportive of this recommendation and happy to talk through uh, any of the details about how we can implement this in the way I think our FY24 budget will show that we've been thoughtful about how to implement it in a way that's uh, the easiest on the ratepayers. So, Megan. Keep, keep talking for one more minute. I still have to get on here. <laughs> uh, Great. Uh, there are a number of macro issues that we are working on, and Megan's pulling up the PowerPoint. One is increasing regulation. A second is an aging plant. Uh, infrastructure. All three of our wastewater plants have not been substantially upgraded in 30 years and uh, we are also uh, analyzing staff capacity on what we need to do the proactive work not just the band-aid work. So as a result we have a proposal here that uh, we'll run through. Yeah so thanks Chapin. Uh as we discussed in our budget presentation, although I was the last one, so I know everybody was tired, so maybe there'll be more questions tonight. Uh, broke out the increases to our expenses uh, with the pie chart, and you know, a significant portion are these proposed staffing additions, so we thought it would make sense to spend a little more time answering people's questions and diving into what those are and why they're proposed and what the third party um, uh, firm you know, thought about those. There are lots of other pressures, the little side a um, uh, pie chart is a lot of the things that we just simply can't control, whether it's the cost of biosolids disposal or the very uh, escalated cost of the treatment chemicals that we need to use at both the water plant and the wastewater plant. So as Chapin mentioned, we brought in Raftelis. Um, they, they performed a staffing assessment for us in 2019, which was shortly after we'd had a number of challenges um, finding some meter meter issues that we had to pay for, um, and then also um, that was a little bit after the 2018 issues with the wastewater plant. So that was sort of the first bite at the apple with me at the new helm, um, really trying to figure out what kind of team do we have and are we missing some players in order to be able to play the game. And so they came back um, and their major observations, uh, as Chapin alluded to, they're sort of in four buckets. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody uh, that we have aging infrastructure. Things are old um, and they are starting to break. And this is compounded by um, the fact that, and I don't have the rate history, but I'd be happy to share it with you. There was an extended period in the 1990s when there was no rate increase for a 10 year period. Had we been having small rate increases and started investing in our infrastructure at that time, I think we would still have a, a challenge on our hand today, but we would not have the challenge that we currently face with the water mains and the plant infrastructure that needs to be replaced. Uh, they found uh, in many areas that there is a lack of staff capacity to conduct needed tasks. So we're able to keep up with the reactive maintenance when things break, we take care of it, but constantly we're trying to get to this level of preventative maintenance, which does have the potential to save the city money and to um, you know, reduce a lot of the disruptions that happen when our infrastructure breaks, beach closures, water main breaks, things like that, if we can just get on top of it and take care of it uh, in advance. A really salient um, example that I've been using was the, uh, the sinkhole that formed on North Ave uh, off of the Beltline. Um, so that was a stormwater outfall, a corrugated metal pipe stormwater outfall. Had we gotten to that outfall and relined that pipe, probably five years ago, it would have been about $20,000. Um, and instead, it broke, created a giant hole that started to threaten somebody's property and ended up costing us about $350,000. You multiply that times all of the outfalls we have, all of the pipes uh, in the city, and if we could ever get in this other mode, um, I think we would be in a different place. Uh, another thing that they had said, which I thought was, you know, it was great for my staff to hear was that we have amazing staff, people know what to do, they just can't get to doing it, you know, which does ca cause this frustration um, cycle. Uh, they also found that when you look at, um, when you account for labor yield, that means that if you have four people for a crew, four people are not always there. There's sick time, there's training time, there's um, family leave time, and that you need to start thinking about how many people do you need 
in order to ensure that you have that minimum number of four. And when they looked at the wastewater plant and when they looked at our water construction crew, they were able to quickly see that they're always sort of short a crew member and thus not able to perform the work that we need them to do. And then the last piece that uh, Chapin had said was, in addition to all the old stuff we have to deal with and the day-to-day -day stuff, there's a whole slew of additional new regulations that we're having to deal with at the same time. Whether it's the Lake Champlain Phosphorus Reduction Plan, so reducing the amount of phosphorus that's coming out of the wastewater plants or stormwater runoff, the combined sewer policy revision, we've done a lot of combined sewer um, mitigation work, but we're not done. We have to keep going. We have to put in a giant tank under Callahan Park. We have to find every other place in the city where we can reduce stormwater runoff. Um, we need to figure out what to do with the sewage that's still backing up into people's basements. It's a pretty complex, detailed pro problem. There's uh, the small streams throughout the city, Inglesby, Centennial, and Potash, which have excessive stormwater runoff and erosion, and thus don't have the characteristics of the stream that regulations require that we have to implement retrofits for. On the water side, they have uh, implemented a new boil water procedure, whereas before we could address a water main break and you know do it carefully so that we're ensuring we're not contaminating the water, but now there are very strict procedures about what we have to do and deciding whether or not we have to implement boil water notices for a larger portion of the city when those happen. And then even as recently as last year, uh, EPA came out with new regulations, the lead and copper rule was revised. We still believe and we have no evidence that there are lead service lines anywhere in Burlington. However, this requires us to actually go through our entire inventory, all of the service lines and verify what the material is. Um, when we've calculated sort of what we have in GIS, we're still looking, I think, on the order of having to verify about 6,000 services, which we're gonna look through our existing records, but if we don't have a piece of paper that says that service is copper or a certain material type, we're literally going to have to get into people's homes and look at the pipe type and determine and record it. So, a lot going on. Um, this, this is the current uh, org chart, just to kind of orient you to the different groups. Uh, over here is the wastewater treatment plant operations. So we have three wastewater treatment plants. Um, main plant, the big one down on the waterfront, one at the very end of North Ave, and then one on Riverside. We have uh, the drinking water treatment system. So that's a crew of people who work to operate that plant 24 seven. It is always staffed, uh, typically by two people. Um, over here on this side is the meter group. So they're the ones who are going in and making sure those meters are working, replacing them, figuring out when they stop, how to replace them. Uh, there's customer care. So there's three people, oops. I can't use my thing. Three, three people there who um, are responsible for sending out the 10,000 bills monthly to the city. Uh, and that, we did increase their capacity a little bit uh, after the original staffing assessment because we were realizing that, you know, some of the mistakes that had happened were also just purely, purely because people didn't have enough time to check everything. Uh, we've recently added some financial staffing capacity, uh, financial assistance capacity with all of the loans and frankly the budgets that we're managing. Uh, it was sort of being juggled between me and the director of finance and administration and we would like to put more effort to that. What I've shown in green are the proposed additions. Um, so over on the wastewater side, Raftelis did recommend that we uh, look at adding another wastewater plant operator. That's likely not a forever <coughs> thing. We anticipate with the upgrades, we are looking at potentially consolidating one of our smaller plants with the larger plant, and I think there will be some opportunities in the future to reassess. Um, but. The plant, the plants, and, and the, the report goes into this, the plants themselves are a very high touch system. They're, while there is automation, because they're old, because I think there was some value engineering that was done uh, in the last upgrade, they require a lot of care and feeding in order to make sure that those are running well. That is going to have to keep happening while we upgrade the plant. We, you know, it's not like you can decommission the existing plant and build a new one because everybody is gonna be 
flushing the toilet 24 seven, we can't ever get everybody to stop doing that. And so we have to maintain this very old system while also bringing an entirely new system up to speed. And I am particularly concerned about the stresses that are going to be on our team uh, during that time period as we, as we you know, tackle that challenge. Um, heading over to the distribution, you want to point it out, Chapin. Sorry, there we go. Yeah. So that is the, one of the places, in addition to the wastewater uh, plant, where when you take into account labor yield, we really need a minimum of four people to do our excavation job safely. Um, five would be even better if everybody's there, but at a minimum we need four. And what we're finding time and time again is somebody's out, somebody's sick, somebody's training, somebody's new, and we don't have those <coughs> two full crews of four. And so by adding two additional um, staff members, we're hoping that we can always ensure that there's those true crews of four. And when on those days everybody is there, we'll have additional capacity to tackle some of the things that we can't get to, such as exercising uh, water valves. There's, I forget how many water valves in the city. I think it's 900. Um, and for the most part, when we go to exercise them and operate them, I think when we recently did that on Main Street, street about 30 to 40% of them weren't holding. That means when we have a water main break, instead of being able to isolate a block or a very narrow area, we have to keep going out until we can find a valve that's gonna hold and stay shut. Um, so from a customer disruption standpoint, being able to get, get out there and exercise those valves, make sure they're working, identify the ones that aren't working, replace them, that is something we have not been able to do and something that we need to do. Um, on the stormwater side, so in the report, they talk a lot about, you know, the stormwater tasks that are not getting done. Our stormwater program manager, it was a position I held uh, when I came to the city. Uh, the program has grown since, you know, its inception in 2009. But my biggest concern with this is that we have extremely robust, very strong, um, I think they're touted in Vermont as being some of the most stringent stormwater regulations for development and redevelopment. Um, people are building stormwater practices, we are building stormwater practices, but the cycle of checking on those practices and making sure they're being maintained, whether it's by our own crews or by private properties, is not happening in the way that it needs to, uh, to make sure that the investments that people are making uh, are you know, actually coming to fruition out there in the field. This is particularly important financially in that We've had conversations with the state. All those regulations that I mentioned, uh, whether it's the um, combined sewer reduction projects or the Lake Champlain phosphorus reduction, there is a willingness. They see what we're doing and there's a willingness for us to be able to take credit for some of the stuff that we have required people to do on private properties if we can ensure that those things are being properly maintained. Otherwise, you know, they're not gonna give us credit for something unless we have it sort of in the books that it's being maintained and therefore is doing something. And then lastly, in the, what I would call sort of the engineering asset management group, um, we went back and forth a lot with uh, the amount of work that is coming down the pike, whether or not we would need another engineer. Um, where we ultimately landed was uh, more of a project manager, not necessarily needing somebody with a PE, but needing somebody who is able to really work on project delivery, um, likely on their own project delivery for some smaller type projects, uh, but will be able to be a force multiplier for the engineers themselves. Instead of the engineers having to deal with contracts and schedules and all these other things, uh, being able to partner with them and make sure that they're kind of carrying the ball of making sure those projects are getting done on time. And then the last one is, uh, still haven't settled on the title, but sort of a utilities inspector slash coordinator. Uh, in DPW, we do have an excavation inspector who does get some eyes on what's going on in the subsurface, but you know, I think their main charge is, is thinking about the paving, pavement surface. And we are, we're finding, and this is historical for many, many years, um, we need somebody who is literally out there and when somebody else is digging is, looking at where they're digging, figuring out is our infrastructure close and does that thing need to be moved? Because when we go to fix a break, half the time there's a gas line, a Comcast line, a something on top of our water line or in, underneath or around. And if we can, we can't deal so much about the past, but we need to make sure that moving forward, we're not making it even harder on ourselves. Um, there's also, uh, by, by creating that position, it does take some pressure off of the distribution group 
who right now have to get pulled from a job and go inspect something instead of just being able to stay and focus on their preventative maintenance tasks. Um, so what, what we did, uh, hopefully this is a helpful visual, is those four, four sort of uh, observations that Raftelis made are across the top and with each of these position types kind of checking off the, the goal, what, where, what goals we're meeting. Um, and then this is the May slash June 2 meeting that we're at to answer questions. And I think with that, I will, um, I will stop. Uh, you know, even though it is a uh, increase to the, ex um, the expense side of our budget through a number of different measures, we were able to keep the rate increase uh, overall to 6.5%. Uh, there's been a couple of years, particularly due to COVID and then also due to our rate change where we did have no rate increase. I would be remiss, and I've talked about this with Councillor Barlow, there is a very uh, tough conversation coming for all of us for probably town meeting 2024 about uh, what sort of bonding we're gonna have to do and what that is going to do to our, our rates. Um, so I don't want to hide the football that there are future rate increases and that they will be we haven't figured out exactly what the plan is, but they're going to be uh, larger probably than we have seen for some number of years. Thank you. Um, is was that that's a that there's no there are no changes from the budget presentation. The only right? thing no the only thing was that I popped this uh, org chart in just so that you both could continue to learn about all of our different uh, areas that we we work on. But yeah, for you to be able to see that visually. Well, thank you. For yep. That. It's good, actually, good to see it a second time. You know, like you mentioned, you were you were you were tired. You were the yeah. last of like seven <laughs> budget presentations. Yeah. Um, I'll open it up for questions. I don't think I have anything specific right now. Yeah, I'm I'm really appreciative of how comprehensive it is yeah. and the work that went into it. Um, I did have a question. You you partially answered mm -hmm. it, I think, already, which was: Are there any of these positions that we're adding that are sort of a result of our current sort of s the state of the system that um, as we made um, these improvements, capital improvements, yep. we would lose besides the wastewater operator system mm -hmm. that you already mentioned. Right. I mean, potentially the project manager, um, if we somehow got through this bubble and were able to slim down, um, that's the only one that I can sort of think of. The, the one piece with that, if you read through the report, they make recommendations, like official recommendations, and they sort of have like future considerations. And one of the things that we're not specifically addressing that has been a long-term need is that we have, we have many facilities, many building envelopes, we have plants, we have roofs, and we don't, we, uh, the city general fund has a facilities management program and we don't benefit from that. So when I need to do a roofing project or replace the, I don't even know how many windows are at the water plant that are all failed. Um, it's like a project that I have to divert a water resources engineer to do, which is not the best use of their zone of genius time. And so it'll be interesting to see whether that need falls away or not. Uh, but that's something certainly we would keep an eye on. Uh, the, yeah, and then the other one would be the plant operator. The interesting part is with both of those, and in uh, probably even as recently as last year, you know, there was a limited service option where if you didn't know if you needed something for a long time, you could hire somebody for a limited service that was like a three-year duration. My understanding is with the current contract that's dropped down to two, and with both of those, I'm gonna need them for at least the next two years, as, as fast as time is passing by, um, probably more on the order of four to five. But the wastewater operator is the one that I could see the most likely shuffle. If we consolidate and if things truly are more straightforward, um, moving some people around. Uh, the old report, the 2019 report, um, did talk about potential changes that we could make in the water plant operations. Um, if you read that old report, right now we have two people on all of the time. I think uh, with some modernization of the plants, to make sure that things are safe. Uh, I And they all know it, I would like to see a moving around of people so we're not having multiple people on at night because you're not gonna get extra work done in the middle of the night. And so if you could have single operator shifts at certain times and enable at a minimum to get all of those people on during the day and just kicking booty on projects, 
that would make me super happy. There might be an opportunity through attrition if everything got dialed in that you could peel back on some of those FTEs, but it would not be safe to do that right now given the quirkiness of the water plant and the power outages and the equipment things that happen. You, you want two people there when it happens so that you can react. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, are there any other questions? I don't know if Gene's with us right now. So. I think he had to pop off. I think he is. He's totally gone. Yeah. yeah, I thought he was gonna multitask a little bit, but that's fine. <laughs> he was there for the budget presentation, so. Yes, right. and he knows where to find me, as do hopefully all the counselors. If, you know, as we get closer to the, um, as we get closer to the budget approval and if stuff comes up or if you're getting questions from your constituents, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a benchmark for me. It, we're not apples to apples. I do like to point out, you know, our sister brother utility, BED, their overall number of staffing, I believe, is on the order of 110, 115 people. This, this protocol or this uh, approach, I think, brings us up to 60 to manage three things, and a lot of which is underground. So it's not the, it's not the reason for, for doing it, but it, I think it, it makes me feel okay as a person who pays uh, water resources bills and lives in the city. and has to answer to my um, neighbors that I feel justified both with a third party review and also with kind of looking at, at, at that balance of, of resources. And so I noticed there's no action asked of the- Nope. Correct. This is gonna to come to- uh, This will be part of the budget approval process and then after that, then we bring these uh, staffing recommendations through. That said, we know these recommendations are significant. We wanna have you you have a chance to really kick the tires on this. Read the Raftalis report. If there are things that you have questions or concerns about, please let us know. Okay. Um, we just know this was significant enough to give an opportunity for the public and you all to have an additional whack at okay. it. Thanks. Thank Appreciate you. It. And thanks for being flexible with my timing. Um, and then I have to say that I made a boo-boo when I amended our agenda because there was one other amendment that I didn't mention, which was to uh, postpone um, the uh, ordinance on carbon fee. It's something that uh, Council Bergman wanted to participate in, so we, um, we're gonna move that to our, to our June meeting. And so, um, since I didn't, I didn't amend it at the beginning of the meeting to be proper, I guess I would entertain um, um, a motion to postpone this item until our June meeting. Do I have to make it or do I second it? Um, you you would make it. And okay. Then I would second it. And we so would I would move that we postpone the discussion on ordinance on carbon fee until our next meeting. Okay. There is somebody raising their hand. That, right. And I'll, 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 yes. I'll, public forum going to happen. Yes, it's going to happen next. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I'll second that. Um, all those in favor of postponing this item? Aye. Aye. And so that is postponed. Um, I apologize for not doing that when we amended. So next is public forum. Um, so I know we have a couple of folks here who want to speak, I'm guessing. And, uh, and we may, do we have anybody online as well? Okay. So um, uh, I'm not sure who was here first. Go ahead, Ashley. Come sure, on up to the microphone so that we get a good audio for the uh, record. <laughs> so I don't have the benefit of the revised. I, will. Um, I can give it to you if you'd like to look at format. It. Um, Thank you. Could you also just state your name for the town meeting TV Pardon viewers? Pardon me, it's Ashley Adams. And I'm here to speak about the McNeil Symposium. Uh, I just printed my own, but this is actually this, the second page of that. Oh, thank you. Okay, I hate to take everyone's time reviewing it. So let me just um, give you a brief couple of comments. I did submit uh, last week uh, an email to counselors with recommendations for um, that format because I, I had concerns that the um, the academics had no time to actually uh, present their material. They were responding to questions based on the previous format. 
um, between um, sandwiched between Burlington Electric's um, responses and um, and then um, responding to the um, academics and in any case it was just heavily biased so it sounds like you may have addressed that I believe that there is um, there's so we want we want to be respectful of those panelists that we're inviting here to share their expertise with we're also trying to answer sort of a narrow uh, sort of a more narrow question about biomass burning with respect to McNeil and the practices that are um, used here for McNeil not necessarily some of the other cases of biomass burning in other places there's some things that are probably uh, germane to the discussion and other things that may be more specific to what we're doing in Burlington. So I think that there's an attempt to sort of shape the conversation and sort of try to get as much accomplished in the amount of time that we have. So that's where the, the questions come in. The, the question questions, themselves. right, the questions that, that we had discussed at our last meeting will shape that. Okay. Um, so will there, will there be an opportunity for the public to weigh in on the format after we've had a chance to review the latest we're going iteration? To post it uh, to the meeting material for tonight um, and certainly you'd be able to I think that we agreed on this format tonight so I think there may still be some tweaks but um, but one of the other challenges is trying to keep this to three hours or less right right indeed um, I'm I'm just I'm particularly mindful of the state that we are in in terms of the lost time in addressing global warming. Um, in part, the media played an enormous role in creating this um, false equivalency between the 99% of climate scientists out in the world with peer-reviewed um, articles and research and so forth and then the climate deniers and giving equal credence to both, you know, quote unquote, both sides, the idea of fair and balanced reporting when you have the science versus um, the denial of the science. I'm just, I'm particularly mindful of that and that's why I'm kind of um, pushing back especially on giving um, plenty of voice to um, conveying that science. So I just wanna be sure that that that, that happens. Um, and then I also think it would be really important, and I'm hoping that you will consider requiring citations for any assertions during the course of the meeting. You know, I, as a Burlington resident, I am really particularly mindful of the greenwashing um, on the part of Burlington Electric. You look at their website, there was recently a um, there was a new podcast out and it was rife with unfounded assertions and the public deserves to know um, where that information comes from so during the course of the symposium if if all parties could be required to provide citations that are then publicly accessible after the meeting that would be really really helpful and then, and then we really have a clear picture um, as, as a member of the public. I, I would appreciate that. And, and I think that's all I, I wanted to share. I'm sorry to take up so much time, but I am really grateful that you're doing this. And I, I came here you know, sounding critical, but I want you to know how grateful I am that you're doing it. I just think it's wonderful. So thank you very much. I appreciate your engagement on it. Yeah, of course. And then I don't know, Steve, if you wanted to see yeah, the. I'm um, basically here supporting Ashley. I'm not okay. Oh, oh, let me ask one question. Sure. Come on. I know Ashley has a copy. I haven't seen your latest. Uh, State your name. Steve Goodkai from no, Burlington. Anybody doesn't know. <laughs> Burlington, Vermont. Just for curiosity, who. Um, chairs the symposium, or who is the person that's going to be the traffic directors of what happens and in what order? The, the two committee will, we haven't assigned that role, but essentially we'll facilitate the meeting. But 
one of you three will be selected or or, would the, or all of us will play a role <laughs> that could be trouble Putting okay in a hat and we'll just <laughs> i suggest one person yeah. okay that's I, I certainly will be involved and ashley has the you have the new okay we'll have to look at that it'll also be posted in our meeting good thanks Anybody else here for public forum? Yeah. If you could just uh, maybe go over to this other chair that's mic'd. I can also move this mic over too as needed. But either way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> just confusing you. I wanted to speak on the prime. State your name. I'm Nick Per Sampieri, and I live in Ward 2. And I want to address the renewable primary heating system ordinance. Is it okay if I talk sure, about that sure. today? Well, well, I, you're welcome to speak to it tonight. We'll be taking it up at our okay. next meeting as well. Great. Um, as I think you know, the current uh, renewable primary heating system ordinance requires that renewable heating be used in new construction and it defines renewable to include electricity, which I think is great. I fully support the city's push towards electrification as a way to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But it also includes within the definition of renewables, heating with wood pellets and wood chips, heating with renewable natural gas, heating with so-called renewable district heating, which includes the proposed steam pipe heating from the McNeil plant, as well as heating with renewable gas. And none of those are climate solutions that will result in greenhouse gas emission reductions. So I hope as you work on the ordinance that you will seriously consider striking those from the definition of renewable. And I can address these issues further at the next meeting when you take this up. Thank, Thank you. you. I guess I'll sure. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll slide over here. Thanks. Come on over. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Carter Wirtz. I'm a community organizer for 350 Vermont, and it's my first time here. so. It's great. <laughs> um, I wanted to back up what, what Nick is saying and, and just um, add on to it. And in the idea, I think that striking these, the kind of biofuels shouldn't be that big of a deal. I don't think that it, it constitutes like a large percentage of the new building heating systems that, are, that have been coming up, but they could in the future um, because I think that's like, in the future horizon of what utilities companies might be doing. Um, so now could be a good time to do that, I guess is what I'm saying, before it's like, before the companies start coming to you and being like, ah, oh, we had all these plans to do it. Um, so that's, that's that, yeah. yeah. And if I could add one other thing. Yeah, pellet stoves in particular have become very popular in certain parts of the country and in fact across the world. I read an article uh, talking about how they've become a middle class status symbol in London and London is having horrible air pollution problems as a result. In addition to not being a climate solution, they're awful for people's health. The, the American Lung Association recommends that you not use wood to heat your home. The Department of, our, our own Department of Health here in Vermont has acknowledged that eliminating wood heat from homes results in improvement in people's health. So that's another reason we just don't want these to proliferate. And I think they could catch on in construction of new single family homes. They might be harder to, they might not be feasible in multi-family construction, but I think it's something we need to be concerned about. Yeah, thank you, and just, just so you know, we're taking up this ordinance at our meeting, but there'll also be opportunities to 
uh, comment on the ordinance in the ordinance committee, and then during the various hearings we'll have at the at the council level, full council level as well. So there's going to be plenty of opportunity to weigh in. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, do we have someone online as well? Thank you. Peter Duval. Go ahead, Peter. Hello, I'm Peter Duval. I live in Underhill. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. I, uh, I want to mention that I really appreciate the layout of the Tugs, uh webpage and uh, the, how convenient it is to keep up with the progress of uh, the Tuke meetings. I'm, I'm commenting on two issues. Uh, first, uh, of course, um, I'd like to talk about McNeil, but also the uh, bike share and e-bikes in general. So I'll get that out of the way. Um, the U.S. is a wild west for e-bikes, and there aren't many e-bikes in the U.S. Europe, on the other hand, has a mature e-bike market uh, to match its mature human-powered cycle market. There's no effective regulation of e-bike mechanical safety or operational performance in the U.S. While a long-standing European Union regulation, EN 15194, ensures that e-bikes, pedelecs as they are called in Europe, uh, are safe to operate and perform similarly to human-powered bicycles. Europe's Regulatory experience matters, and it's developed over, over decades. All major bike manufacturers produce e-bikes that conform to this EN15194 standard, including Bird. And Burlington should require that all the bike share bikes and rental bikes conform to EN15194. Also, BED should pay incentives only for e-bikes that meet EN15194. I'm just moving to comment on McNeil. Uh, New York and New Hampshire are two very different governments. And both have moved to shut down wood chip power plants, fairly new ones, and for, fair, for apparently different reasons, economics in New Hampshire and emissions in New York. Uh, free Energy Black River at Fort Drum, New York, New York has uh, just recently been shut down uh, after quite a, quite a fight by opponents, as I understand it, keep it open. Um, and Burgess Biopower has long missed its uh, economic targets, and, and it's struggling to, to gain more subsidies from New Hampshire legislature. Meanwhile, McNeil's sister plant, Dow Corning Midlands in Michigan, closed decades ago. So I have two questions that I think you might want to add to the symposium. And there, these are questions that BED officials should be answering. What, is, what does BED know about wood chip power plants that regulators in New York and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, by the way, don't know? Why should McNeil stay open when all of these other plants have closed. The other question is about fuel supply for McNeil, which, as we know, is mostly from out of state. How does New York feel about McNeil's fuel harvest and the attendant Lulu CF emissions occurring, occurring in New York? Or put another way, so you don't have to speculate about um, sentiment, 
what is the risk that New York will take an interest in being burdened with biogenic emissions on its landscape that it does that it would not allow power plants in its own regulatory jurisdiction to um, effect. So thank you for my for the time to comment. Really appreciate it. Do we? Go ahead, Pike. Hi, I'm Pike Porter, Burlington resident. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, the first one um, is regarding the uh, BTV slideshow regarding um, airport emissions um, last month, I believe, maybe two months ago. Um, the airport, um, I believe, was representing emissions from 2019, including VTANG emissions from 2019. However, um, with a public re records request, I asked to see the uh, actual data behind those emissions, and Burlington Airport was unable to provide me with those. They said they didn't have any records, which leads me to, and I hope leads to, to some questions about how the airport um, came up with these numbers if VTANG didn't supply them with any information for 2019. Um, Along those lines, um, back in November of uh, last year, uh, the city council sent a uh, VTANG climate resolution to Took for Took to take up, um, and it's been pigeonholed uh, since November. And I'm just um, seeing when that might be come up for discussion in, in the Took. We'd have to ask um, Director Longo about that. I just, that's the first time I've heard of that. So, um, and on the other than the resolution, I'm, I'm, I'll have to look at our agenda and see. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone else in the queue? No? Okay, well, then I'll go ahead and close public comment. And next, I think we're grabbing up. FY24 fleet purchase and dissolution discussion. Thanks. Thanks. Just to set this up, I know we have a couple other media items. Uh, you know, you've heard through the budget process that we're in a bit of a tight position. You've got the memo in your packet. I think, Lee, the key piece, and I think we have Ashley online. Do we have Ashley? She unable to stick around. Um, so we really wanted to get your input on this fleet FY24 recommendation, uh, but understanding that we all are going to need to work together to solve the longer term issue. Yeah, so as you see in the memo, it's a lot shorter vehicle list than we've had in previous years. Uh, there's seven vehicles total. Sorry, Ashley okay. is online. She's under. Can you promote her to a panelist? Thank you, actually. Um, of those seven vehicles, six of them are enterprise and special revenue vehicles, one the, the seventh being the recycling, which each have their own source of funding. There will be, as you saw in the memo, and what Chavin spoke to, no general fund vehicles purchased this year. Um, of the seven, three of them are electric vehicles, uh, two are hybrid, and two are uh, internal combustion engines. One being a recycling truck and the other being a one ton utility truck for water distribution. Um, we have met with VED to have them uh, review our uh, vehicle replacement list and see what expected um, rebates we can get. Um, the, the smaller EV vehicles, um, I did include a cost sheet as an attachment uh, with the memo. Uh, we will be getting rebates for you know the Chevy Bowl. Um, the transit van we have, they do have a stipulation that if it exceeds the uh, uh, $60,000 um, limit that there will be no rebates. So we have it estimated at 60, so we'll have to see when we do go out for actual quotes, um, if we will qualify for that rebate. 
as well as the gem car, which is it's like a mid-size, it's smaller than like the Chevy Bolts, not quite like a UTV vehicle. Parks and Rec currently has one. Um, that's one of the planned vehicles for water distribution to do their hydrant flushing. Uh, that will, um, we are currently working with BED to get a custom uh, rebate for that one because there's not a similar vehicle out there. So they're kind of working off of the previous one we did for parks, making sure nothing's changed in that scenario. Um, so that, that's really the, the short of it for vehicle replacement. We aren't replacing any heavy equipment. Um, and we've got Ashley here who has her hand up. She might have a few things to add. Oh, <laughs> no, sorry. I, I'm sorry, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I'm not really sure. I must be logged on as DPW and I think that's causing problems. I. I don't have anything else to add. I'm here to help answer questions if there are any concerns about any of the financing information in the memo that you've been provided today or, um, yeah, anything else that you might need. Thanks, Ashley. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, um, do you have questions? I don't think so. Um, I guess I have just a, a couple. So this this is much a much smaller list than what we've had in the past, yes. and I understand the reason for that is the sort of capital constraints that we're under right now. Yeah. Um, well, during the budget presentations, we we saw that we have a we have a short we have a shortfall basically on how you know how we're going to manage um, lease payments going forward, um, and this is included in that, correct? Right. Okay. So this that was inclusive of this. Addition. Correct. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, yes. It's, and you were, in, the vehicle deferred list was also included, which in previous years we've had deferred vehicles. They may not have been high priority vehicles that, you know, their life expectancy is going longer than what we suggested, certain pieces of equipment, but that, that deferred vehicle list has really increased with the lack of funding for the general fund and a majority of those are you know police vehicles emergency response vehicles um some plow trucks so that deferred list is up over three million million dollars as of fy24 and going forward in fy25 we will have some leases dropping off and correct me if i'm wrong ashley but we're still going to have that gap in funding we don't have sustainable funding plan going forward that we need to address. Yeah, I'll just leave you correct. Um, right now we're projecting to have another million dollar need to have release payments alone in fiscal years 25 and 26, and then it drops down. Um, and so that is something that we're working to find a solution for, some of which I think you've seen in your packets, um, some ideas to try to create a sustainable funding source for fleet um, so that we can build up to be able to purchase um, purchase vehicles again. Um, and I think you're all aware that we have a hold this year. I, I couldn't hear everything Lee was saying, but that we have a hold on FY24 for buying buying a new thing. So yeah. Uh, there should have been an ambulance this year, which they uh, fire is going after some grant funding for that. So um, mm -hmm. we are allowed, or we have talked about with CT office that if general fund departments can find alternate funding or grants, then with a conversation with the CAO and you know, given permission, they can pursue replacing a vehicle we really don't want to add to the vehicle list but if there's a replacement out there and they have alternative funding then then we'll look into that option but 
there will be no general fund purchases. And I guess just to add to what um, Lee was saying, you know, we are projecting at least a $2 million need for purchase of new vehicles annually, regardless of what the vehicle types are. So that is the, you know, without thinking of how, how big our deferred list is now as a result of the decisions we've had to make, um, if we could get to a point of replacing vehicles, $2 million would be um, a good target for the city. She said what I need to say. Great. Perfect. Thanks, <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> and, and in the one of the things that's going to be undertaken and is um, mentioned in the memo is, um, is an effort to try to figure out what a sustainable funding yeah. source is. And that'll, that work is... I'm, I'm sure it's already begun. And yeah. yeah, that's where we formed a like a subcommittee of our fleet committee and met with a CT office team to discuss options, and that's where you see a lot of the options in the memo came from. Um, it's almost, you know, starting from scratch. Well, um, you're not looking for action, or you are looking for action? Yes, we are yeah. looking for action to recommend the uh, approval of the fleet purchase list for 24 and the fleet dissolution list. Um, so I move that we approve the fleet purchase list for FY24 and the, what was the second one? Dissolution. In the dissolution. Okay. Yeah. Is there language, Lee, and there is a oh, we did have a Oh, there is in the memo? Yes. I'm sorry, I missed that. Because it adds in the auctioning of the vehicles as well. Okay, yeah. Okay, let me find so it. So if friendly, that that suggested motion could just be moved in seconds. Yes. Um, so I rem recommend the Board of Finance and City Council approve the proposed FY24 fleet purchasing list and authorize the Department of Public Works fleet maintenance to auction the FY24 replaced vehicles, equipment through various online public auctions or trade in to vendor where vehicle slash equipment is purchased. If there is no public interest or the vehicle is of no value to the vendor, fleet maintenance will have the vehicle slash equipment hauled away for scrap at the current market price. And I'll second that. Okay. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And so we'll look for that at the Board of Finance and the full council. Yes. Thank you. Um, next, we have, if I've, see if I've gotten everything else straight here with our changes tonight. I think next is our expected executive session. And yeah, uh, I think the only question would be whether or not you want to hit any of the perfunctory items at the end before, before we go in. That's a good idea, actually. So why don't we do that? I guess the next item then would be the director's report. I'll keep it short. Uh, I think the big news here was you probably saw the release from um, from the mayor's office that the court case, uh, the litigation uh, on the Champlain Parkway was decided in the city's favor. This is the seventh consecutive positive legal ruling that we've had uh, against the same two litigants uh, for the Champlain Parkway project. Uh, and this means that the project is cleared to complete its initial construction contract, which is the middle section of the project from Home Avenue to Kilburn Street, which means Lakeside and Pine Street, the two streets right outside our window, will be under construction later this year. Excellent. That's good news. Yep. Um, are there any uh, councilor updates? Yeah. Um, I just want to express my appreciation for some of the patching that's been going on the new North End. I know I've been a nuisance to to those who do paving, um, asking for asking for these things. But um, I've heard I've heard positive feedback on that. And I appreciate it. So, thank you. Um, Pleasure. You do know we're going to the Ward Four Seven NPA tomorrow night. Yes. They've been asked to give a report, so we're happy to talk to the public and hear their concerns at that meeting. Excellent. I'll see you there for that yeah. as well. Great. Um, our next meeting um, is scheduled for the 27th, Tuesday, the 27th of this of uh, June. Excuse me. That works for everybody. We'll assume it works. Yeah, it's already on my calendar. It works. Um, and uh, now we'll go to our executive session. Um, 
Got it. You have the yeah. motion? Okay. Uh, awesome. Move to enter executives. Sorry, that just became like jumbled in my head. Move to enter executive session pursuant to one. Do I have to read the one VSA 313A2 to discuss the, the negotiating and and or securing of the purchase and sale of 195 through 201 Flynn Ave Avenue parcels? Um, and I will second that. And before we vote on it, I, um, I'll give um, you some an opportunity to sort of set it up so the public knows why we're going into executive session. Sure, I could give a quick overview unless Haley, you'd like to do that. No. Go ahead, I can chime in if anything Great. Uh, generally, as we've presented to the Ward 5 NPA, that there uh, is an option that the city has to purchase 195 201 Flynn Avenue. Uh, for the purposes of establishing e uh, either a CSWD drop-off center and or a soil management facility for the city of Burlington. Uh, we have generally discussed the project at the Ward 5 NPA, talked about what we'd like to do and uh, the process and timeline, but as it relates to the negotiations with CSWD around purchase price and terms, uh, we recommend that that conversation happen in executive session. Um, and then we'll uh, a vote to go into uh, executive session. We will come out of executive session to adjourn the meeting. Um, I don't know if town meeting TV wants to stick around for that or they can sign off now if they'd like. So um, we will, uh, we'll, um, all those in favor of going into executive session? Aye. Aye. And so we will be in executive session. Maybe it'll be friendly for us to meet in another room to allow CCTV to break down. Yeah. If because there will be no action yeah. taken. Thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.